Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Haig reporting from Southern India. I'd like to uh, introduce a new series of videos on the channel in which we, the members of the School for Banned Texts, finally embark on that challenge, which um, for most people interested in Western philosophy um, is something of a bucket list challenge which uh, sits on the shelf for year after year, collecting dust, much like the book which it involves. This is the bucket list challenge of finally reading every one of the platonic dialogues. Now, that is obviously a lot of material to go through as you can see just from the size of this book, um, the collected dialogues of Plato edited by Hamilton and Keynes, if you're interested. Um, this is obviously a very big book, and um, it has been, quite frankly, sitting on my shelf um, for about 13 years or something like this. I got this back in 2009 when I was first studying um, uh, philosophy in undergrad, and back in those days when it was still possible for something like assigning Plato on a college campus um, to be done, um, which, by the way, was only um, something that I saw from professors who had gotten their PhDs back in the 1970s. Uh, to my knowledge, all of these professors um, have since either retired or passed away. So their understanding of philosophy on a college campus back in the days when the purpose of that was something other than maximizing the sale of student loans for Sally May, well, um, they, they showed through their own um, teaching methodology, um, reflecting that older view, that um, even calling um, the collected dialogues of Plato this much material is is something of an understatement because their own um, prescription when um, assigning Plato was that the students had to read the text more than once. In fact, they had to read the text a recommended three times. The first time, they said, was simply to establish the general ideas of the text, which by the way is more difficult when you're reading a dialogue because you have multiple voices, there's a lot of questions, there's a lot of answers, but ones which maybe cannot be attributed to the ultimate author of this, who is, of course, Plato himself. So even if you hear a voice say something within a platonic dialogue, it is very difficult to deduce what Plato himself thought, if it is indeed any of the things you hear in this book. That is why you have to read the text more than once, the first time just to establish um, the general ideas, the second time to sort of fill in the fine details, and the third time to read with your own maybe active response of whether you agree or disagree with what is being said. And by the way, do you have an answer for the kinds of deep philosophical questions being put forth here regarding things like knowledge and being and um, things like that, uh, you know, the deepest questions of philosophy. And in fact, um, that third reading in which you provide responses to that, we have a name for that. It's simply called Western philosophy. Bertrand Russell noted, for example, that uh, pretty much everything written over the past, what, two and a half thousand years, the uh, philosophy professors of yesteryear, or rather yester century, used to joke that um, Plato and Aristotle were active during the High Fives BC, that era, but at 2,500 years of, um, of writing and, and also discussion, speaking with, within um, the history of Western philosophy, has really been, according to Bertrand Russell, just footnotes on Plato, or we could say, using the terminology of my uh, my uh, professors from yester century, um, that uh, doing Western philosophy really is just um, doing that third reading, once again, in which you provide a response to the questions within Plato's um, dialogues. And this is a debate which, once again, despite the thousands of years that have passed, it's still ongoing. Um, you could find this in the literal sense that um, uh, Telos Bound, um, the YouTube channel of Trade and Lunet, who um, is the author of Aphasis, uh, The Impossibility of Subjectivity, the, the best philosophy book um, released last year, and, and really just the best book in general uh, that was released last year. Well, on his um, YouTube channel, um, he recently hosted a very fascinating debate between um, Graham Harmon, the uh, inventor of triple O object oriented ontology, and uh, Todd McGowan, a proponent of a more Hegelian um, ontology of contradiction. Okay, And a lot of the stuff they were talking about, it seems to me, is basically that third reading of Plato and trying to provide um, answers to questions regarding um, the ontological status of the appearances accessible to the five senses, what is real knowledge, um, what is being, all of these things which now phrased within either Hegelian or triple O um, terminology really are still ultimately going back to questions, okay, that were um, introduced in these texts. That's why it's so important for us now to systematically go through every one of these dialogues. And there is, um, in fact, uh, an order to this reading, which was proposed by one of the um, members of the school himself. And uh, I think 
think that this is the best time for you to um, at least consider joining in, okay? Um, you, it, for instance, two dollars per month, okay? Um, at a time when many people are making the right decision of walking away from the Netflix model of twenty dollars a month for shows which you haven't actually heard of before, you're not going to necessarily find things from, say, decades ago, the classics that you actually like and want to watch, you'll find a bunch of original shows, and do you really have the time and money for something like that that's really not going to expand your mind? Well, why not make the investment of just $2 a month and join in on something that will certainly expand your mind and help you to uh, think for the rest of your life? But at any rate, before we get into that um, third reading of the text, which, by the way, um, I have some of the first reading videos already on this channel. Um, some of the earliest videos I did when I brought the channel back in April of 2018 were those sort of first reading videos on dialogues like the Phaedo, um, the, the Apology, um, some of those dialogues like like the Meno, and then later on um, the Cradleist, the Theatetus. You have some of these first reading um, uh, videos in which we establish the general idea of, of the text, which is important once again because he, he was not writing treatises where it's all clearly and explicitly spelled out in a linear manner, okay, building up one line of thought um, in ever ever greater detail, like you say, with, uh, uh, with uh, Kant's Critique of Pure Reason. It's something rather different. So we have the first um, video, the first reading videos already on the channel for some of them, but we still need the third <laughs> reading in which we um, actively respond whether we agree or disagree. And that is something which is going to appear on this channel, um, once again, even for those videos that I've already quote unquote done videos on. But um, before we get into all of that, I think it would be important now to take a moment to introduce some very general information about Plato and also about Socrates. Now, one of the signs, quite frankly, of somebody who either has not read Plato or only halfway read Plato maybe decades ago because it was assigned in college, one of the signs of such a person is their tendency to attribute Platonic sayings to Socrates himself. Now, it's understandable that one would make an error like that because the, the funny thing about the Platonic dialogues is that um, they actually seem more like Socratic dialogues. When you read them, the character who's speaking, and by the way, seems to be the mouthpiece for Plato himself, is simply Socrates. But why do we say it is an error to call these Socratic sayings as such. Well, the thing about Socrates is that for one reason or another, we have no writings left by the man himself. It's kind of a similar position to Jesus. This main similarity between um, Jesus and Socrates is that people might be very familiar with um, sayings of them, but uh, those are always filtered through someone else who wrote an account about them, often for very biased purposes. And um, Jesus and Socrates themselves both left behind no original writings. And um, people are maybe more or less aware that there are many different accounts of Jesus, even from the ancient era. You have not just the four Gospels, and then you have the testimony of Paul, which also attributes certain things to Jesus which cannot be found in the Gospels. Um, wasn't it in uh, the book of Corinthians? He, he He's recorded as appearing to like 500 people. You don't find that within the Gospels. Um, it's been some years since I've read that, but something like that. So you have um, the biblical testimonies of Jesus um, as coming from different original sources. It does not appear that uh, Paul had read the Gospels for the simple fact that they were written after he had lived, but he was still familiar with um, certain accounts of things that Jesus had done, and he had a, a certain understanding of who Jesus himself was. Well, we have these differing accounts within the Bible, and then even beyond that, you have um, the non-canonical Gospels, the Apocrypha, and those continued for hundreds of years <laughs> after um, Jesus um, had died um, and come to, uh, at, over time, uh, explicitly, simply, um, express the ideology of the person who wrote the text. So if you are a brand of quote-unquote heretic, like um, say a Gnostic Christian um, within the centuries after Jesus had died, um, your own ideas as a Gnostic um, are not simply going to be attributed to you speaking, they're going to be filtered through the mouth of Jesus and that's going to make them more credible, more believable to whatever person comes across that text. Well, um, similarly with um, Socrates, we have differing accounts, not so much, I think, continuing long, long after his death, because um, I think that um, the competition among the texts was definitively won very early on to the point now that many people are not aware that um, the Platonic Socrates is only one of three that we have preserved even to the present day. 
In addition, you have the very negative portrayal of Socrates in the comedy play by the ancient Greek playwright Aristophanes. Um, the play was called The Clouds, which just openly portrays Socrates as a buffoon who doesn't actually know anything and as a complete fraud. He, some people follow him thinking he has wisdom or something like that, but uh, if you actually um, look at his words within the play, um, he's ridiculed to the point that one could not possibly imagine him being the same Socrates who um, actually had profound enough questions to launch 2,500 years of debate among, quite frankly, some of the greatest minds that have you know, ever existed. So that is one portrayal of Socrates as somebody who is, um, who has the bias against him to try to make him look as bad as possible. But, um, there was, um, in contrast with that, not just the very positive portrayal of Socrates in Plato, in which we have this understanding that he's not just, um, a, a great thinker devoted to trying to actually gain wisdom and the truth, um, rather than the kind of sick and uh, sad and a completely fraudulent imitation of that that you find with the sophist. More about that later. But um, you actually have the idea that he wasn't just a great thinker and he wasn't just really uh, genuinely seeking out wisdom rather than, say, trying to make money for himself or gain reputation. He was actually a martyr in the literal sense of the term that um, he had to drink the hemlock. He was put to death because um, uh, of, you know, not only the injustice of the state, but also because of his own willing acceptance of that death, willing to be a martyr because he believed his own ideas about, say, uh, platonic dualism, the idea that the soul will live on long after the body, and not just that, but um, the thing it had been trying to do when it was in the body, which was try to gain wisdom, it'll actually be able to do that better after it leaves the body, because where it's going is pr precisely the realm of ideas themselves. Insofar as you have knowledge within this fallen state of incarnation and embodiment, that um, is not really learning things new for the first time from the five senses, rather um, insofar as you really learn anything, any true knowledge, it is a recollection of things already known, but they were not already known within this life, nor even within a previous life, which maybe is closer to the Hindu view of something like in, um, reincarnation. You have the idea in the Mahabharata and the Ramayana that um, the characters um, are living with the long-term consequences of things done in previous lives, which um, the things themselves in those previous lives have been forgotten, but they still live with the effects with only a halfway understood consciousness of them. But um, Krishna, who um, is God, um, has the full understanding, the full picture. He sees what has been forgotten in those previous lives, and that allows him to understand better what is really going on, whether it's just or unjust, what has happened to a person in this life. Well, in Plato, we have the idea, rather, that it is not just what happened in a, what you learned in a previous life, is rather what you learned between lives, when you were fully a soul, not in this material realm, but rather in the world of ideas. And insofar as you might know something like a circle, or rather a circular object in the world of materiality, um, your knowledge of the purified circle is possible not because of your ability to abstract from material objects seen now, which is maybe a materialist and later, quote-unquote, more modern way of viewing it. Rather, for Plato, um, you can recollect things about circles because in the world of ideas you saw the perfect circle, which is defined as the shape for which every point is equidistant from the center. No matter how close you might get to representing that within the realm of materiality, you will never actually have a perfect circle for which, once again, every point is exactly equidistant from the center. Um, there's also an understanding um, back in the days of, say, a middle school geometry class, you used to hear things like, as soon as you draw a circle, on a piece of paper, you're already not really dealing with a circle because even if it's so um, small that you can't perceive it with the naked eye, by drawing it with your pencil, you've added some depth to it and now it's not a circle. Now it is a cylinder, okay? So real circles don't exist and can't exist within the realm of materiality, not even as drawn on a piece of paper, but we can still know many things with very, um, good um, mathematical precision about circles because we recollect things we had already known when we saw the perfect form of a circle. And it's not just the circle, by the way. It is um, also the uh, uh, perfect um, other shapes like uh, the perfect square. All the sides are equal to the perfect equilateral triangle. But beyond that, um, things with a non-mathematical character, like we know the form of the perfect human, the perfect 
horse, the perfect tree, and not just those um, things with a physical existence, but we know things like justice. Okay, We can have some idea of what the just society would look like because we know what justice itself is because we saw the form of that too in another realm. And beyond that, you have this very mysterious idea that the plurality of ideas in the world of ideas is itself just a stepping stone on the way to in the metaphor of the cave which we'll get back to in much greater detail when we actually read it um you, you have um not just uh, the plurality of ideas you have the sun and the sun is a metaphor for something else which you might call the good or you might even say that that sun is like the one in the dialogue the Parmenides, arguably his most challenging dialogue at least the most challenging we've read so far in which the paradoxes of the one and the many which leads you to simply throw your hands up in the air at some point within the dialogue and say well the one can't exist because the paradoxes of um, the, the one and the many are simply too much to overcome. There must simply be the many and no one. But is the one maybe like the sun, the good, which goes beyond the illusion of the plurality of the many ideas? Now, that's something we have to talk about in greater depth. But um, for, uh, for Socrates, um, as portrayed by Plato, once again, to get back to that point, you have this idea that he believed this so much that um, he was not just willing to put his money where his mouth was. He was um, willing to, if you will... Um, let go of not just his money, but um, his entire life, which is worth far more than that. And um, that is the portrayal you have there. Now, what is the third portrayal of Socrates? Most people don't know that Xenophon had also written a portrayal of Socrates, which is probably the most historically accurate, simply because it is the most boring. This is a principle of historical methodology also used by um, New Testament scholars, by the way. Um, the idea is that if you have a choice as an early biographer, of um, Jesus between a much more interesting account and a much less interesting account of the same event, which one would you choose? Um, it's obvious that if you have the choice between um, Robert M. Price's own example, um, between um, Elijah literally coming back um, at the transfiguration of Jesus on the mount, um, uh, Moses and Elijah come back and only the disciples see it, right? Um, that's, according to Robert M. Price, a later account of um, the same idea that uh, other parts within the other Gospels, you have the idea that, well, no, Elijah came back, but it was only metaphorical. This is Robert M. Price's idea that, well, uh, some people understood that Jesus was just a metaphorical um, return of Elijah. No, others went further then and said, no, Elijah really returned, but he was a different person than Jesus because Jesus is God. Now, I'm not meaning to get into which of those is really true, etc. It doesn't matter for our present purposes. The idea um, of doing history that um, you have uh, a tendency for a story to become more interesting over time because even within fish stories in America, every time you catch, every time you tell the story about how big the fish was that you caught, um, it gets a little bit bigger. Um, we have something like that within, say, uh, the attempt to reconstruct the historical Socrates. The least interesting Socrates is probably the most realistic, okay? Um, the most interesting Socrates, of course, um, is not just the humorous Socrates you find in Aristophanes, which surely has many embellishments on the part of Aristophanes to try to make the story funnier than it otherwise would have been. Um, the, really, the most interesting one is just the Socrates of Plato's dialogues, because he introduces so many philosophical problems that the best minds could um, leave them unsolved um, in much the same way that you have unsolved problems within mathematics, which the best mathematical minds can't solve. Um, well, you have unsolved problems within philosophy too, and those really were introduced by Socrates within the Platonic texts. But wait a minute, how much of that is embellishment by Plato himself using Socrates as a mouthpiece for his own ideas? Now, I really can't answer that in this video. We'll just have to maybe read all of the texts themselves to try to find out. A few other things I want to mention before closing out this video is that um, once again the great villain of the texts is the sophists but who were the sophists now you may not know that um, one of the cognates of sophist is um, sophisticated or rather we etymologically derived it from so when you call somebody sophisticated you don't realize as my professors from the who were educated in the 60s and 70s used to joke you don't realize when you call someone sophisticated you're literally saying that there's someone who's been fucked over by a sophist and that's the words they used in class so um, the idea is that the sophists might make you sophisticated okay um, but um, they won't actually help you 
to get any closer to wisdom, truth, or the good, the ultimate good, the unity of the good beyond even the plurality of ideas, let alone the plurality of physical objects. We have this hierarchy in Plato um, represented by the allegory of the cave in which, to tell this very quickly, imagine some people have been chained for their whole lives in a cave underground um, for which there's a fire behind their backs and a set of puppets for which they only see the shadows. One day um, the chains are broken, one of them can see that those shadows are actually shadows of puppets. And the puppets are puppets of things like men, horses, etc., which actually really exist, but he's never seen those. Well, he escapes from the cave, and at first the sun is so blinding that he can only look down and sees a pool of water. In the pool of water, he sees um, horses and men, but he sees their reflections within water. He thinks to himself, well, this is more real than the shadows on the wall, more real than the puppets. Um, but he doesn't realize that that's just a stage on the way to something realer than that, which is the actual men and horses walking around. He doesn't realize at that point that even those are representations. Representations of what? Well, as materialists and secularists, we have this understanding that no, 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 those are the real things, there's nothing beyond it. Well, for Plato, um, those are representations of the idea of the horse, the idea of the man, the, and beyond that, the idea of justice and things like that. Well, even if he makes it to the world of ideas and sees the idea of them, once again, beyond that lies further still the good. And that is one of the challenges, I think, because you you see something like that within John Michael Greer's account of the Hermetic tradition. By the way, was his first published book. It wasn't the first book he'd written. He claimed in, I think, one Archdrude Report post that he'd authored about 10 science fiction novels um, before he had anything published, but the market for publishing science fiction has become so competitive, largely because of a, a drop in readership, quite frankly. He described it once that there's so few readers, there's so so little market growth within science fiction that it's become so competitive that the number of um, new titles they'll actually publish through mainstream channels has become so small that even um, a writer as great as Greer um, was basically was not able to break into that market in the 1990s. The first book he published was instead about um, hermetic um, magic, and in that book he talks at the very beginning about the way that one of the goals of hermetic magic is to go beyond the illusion of the plurality of things you see with the five senses to reach the one. Now, that's a very platonic idea, and we could maybe um, explore a lot more the connection between Plato and the Hermetic tradition. We also have the idea from um, Julius Evola's book on the Hermetic tradition that when Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is within you, there are many Hermetic quotes very similar. In fact, there's an Egyptian proverb which basically says the same thing. Now, um, that does not mean that one is more true than the other or only one of them. It, maybe it's just an idea of tradition in general, okay? Including a, 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 an idea of tradition you can find not only in Hinduism, the idea that the Dehi maybe occupies the Deha as a temporary vehicle, but is in itself the infinite, in a way that the Deha as the vehicle of the body is not. Okay. And you have to go a step further than that to realize that the infinity of my consciousness is not just my soul as an individualized soul in, say, the Abrahamic traditions. Um, especially Christianity, but rather is the one infinite of Brahman. And the ultimate goal of Hinduism, if you read Hindu devotional texts and lectures as I have been recently, the goal of Hinduism is to not go to heaven, but rather to elevate consciousness through things like yoga, which by the way is not to be confused with mere exercise as it's um, shown in the West. Rather, um, mastery of the body over material um, material um, conditions, okay, in the sense of going beyond the uh, immersion you have in the material reality around you. You go beyond those material conditions through yoga to hopefully reach the level of having infinite consciousness to the point that you simply merge with Brahman, which is the one infinite, okay? Once again, the one, you go beyond the layers of the plurality of the many to reach the one. That is a goal in Hinduism. You find maybe a very, very vague recollection of that in the, the kingdom of heaven is within you, according to Julius Evola. At the very least, it's within the hermetic tradition. Um, you try to um, not escape from the body altogether through alchemy, as Evola noted, but rather you try to use alch alchemical methodology to 
elevate this body as an individuating principle to realize the infinite within it when the metaphor of turning lead into gold. And you find something like that within Plato. Um, you have this idea once again in Plato that uh, the goal, okay, even to the point that Socrates was willing to die for it, the goal is to, um, within this individual principle of the body, do philosophy now within the body to elevate consciousness to the point, I guess, that in the world of ideas, which is not guaranteed, by the way, if you have a bad life, this life, you'll be reincarnated as a dung beetle is the joke at the end of the Republic. You can um, not only go the world of ideas, but go beyond that to the one. Well, what is the one? Is that like Brahman within Hinduism? I don't know. That's something we'll be debating. But at the very least, um, to go back to the problem of the sophists, the sophists are not interested in that. The sophists are interested in helping people to learn how to use language, or rather abuse language, to win arguments. And in exchange for teaching these uh, skills as basically professional bullshitters, they want money. Okay. And um, Socrates noted multiple times, Socrates in Plato's dialogues, that um, the sophists don't just make you as bad a human. They don't just um, fail to help you progress. They actually make you worse. So it's like taking something to a repairman who actually just breaks it further and charges you a lot of money. Oh, well, we have a word for that today. They're called professors. What they're called, that's called the academic industry in America. They make you a worse thinker, and they put you so deep in debt that you'll um, have to basically, you'll um, be... Um, basically left with the choice of assuming a false identity in your own country just to escape from the debt payments. I say this jokingly, of course, was one of the options which Alan Cullinge noted in his book, The Student Loan Scam in 2009, one of the only options he had, he claims after defaulting on um, over $100,000 of, of um, debt from Sally Mae, which, which was originally a fraction of that. It, it multiplied into like hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, so the sophists today, we know who they are. That's the academic industry. And they're sophists because they teach you how to abuse language to get out of trouble in much the same way that you see with um, Amber Heard right now with the Johnny Depp trial. Um, the, uh, the lawyer, um, Camila Vasquez, I think is her name, Johnny Depp's lawyer, um, has noted that Amber Heard has an excuse for everything. Anything that could possibly happen, she has an excuse for it. I think that um, Amber Heard might have um, actually served in the Biden administration because anything that happens on their watch um, is also, they have an excuse for it. Uh, baby shortage formula, uh, it was uh, Trump from years ago and it was the people who banned abortion years into the future whenever it takes full effect. It was them. They time traveled to cause the baby formula shortage um, and all of the other things that are not our fault, inflation, etc. So they abuse language and because they have no understanding of the truth because in a certain sense they don't even believe in the truth at this point. And the antidote to this nonsense you have is of course um, Plato, Socrates, and you could argue this whole world of tradition in which there's a lot of overlap among the ideas. So thank you. I'm looking forward to this. Once again, join the school to be a part of it.